we're going to hear a clip now of somebody, and I must say, I have to admit that I was quite surprised that we actually had in our RTE archive collection the voice of this particular man. He um, went to America, and from America he went to Germany. And you, you, the public would be aware of his effort, efforts to get the Irish prisoners of war organised into a brigade to come home and fight for Ireland. It was a romantic idea. Those of us who knew Ireland at the time and knew the type of people who joined the army then, most of them, uh, are, were, were recalled to the army, people who had been, say, in the militia and so on, knew that was rather a hopeless task. Nationalism didn't mean anything to a good many of these people at all. They wouldn't know what it meant. However, he tried to do it and failed. That's the voice of a man who uh, was in his heyday more than a century ago. You can hear the Belfast accent of Dennis McCullough, the uh, political activist and one-time president of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, talking about Sir Roger Casement's crusade to Germany a century ago in December 1914. His mission was to persuade Irish prisoners of war to, in effect, switch sides and earn their freedom from a German POW camp by joining his Irish brigade and fighting alongside the volunteers in an insurrection against against British rule. On paper, it may have seemed to him like an ingenious strategy, but was Caseman's plan a hopeless task, as was suggested there by McCullough? Conor Mulva, lecturer in history, in uh, Irish history at University College Dublin, working on uh, commemoration, is here to tease this one out, alongside barrister John McGuigan, who has a particular interest in Caseman. You're both very welcome. Um, So, first of all, what was a distinguished British civil servant and a Northern Protestant, Sir Roger Casement, doing in the nationalist movement in the first place? Well, Miles, I think that Roger Casement is one of these figures who comes to the Irish volunteers through a sense of anti-imperialism. And here I would link him with the other most fantastical and also um, most incredible story of, of the Irish Revolution, and that's the story of Erskine Childers. Because both Ers- uh, Erskine Childers and Roger Casement witness the barbarity of the British Empire at first hand um, and of, of imperialism generally. Casement obviously had been to the Belgian Congo where he had written his report on King Leopold the, the II's um, abuses there including mutilation of people who refused to go and collect rubber, um, murder, uh, all, all these other, um, I suppose, the worst abuses of imperialism. And then he'd gone to Putumayo where um, Casement believed that America had, had, had gone in where Britain couldn't and, and again this is part of a, a wider anti-imperialist narrative. So by the by about 1911, Casement has moved firmly away from being a, a servant of the British Crown um, towards being somebody who is vehemently against um, the entire imperialist project. And, and I do see him as an anti-imperialist figure as much as a nationalist figure. But um, as it was sort of seen at the time, he had moved away from... Uh, from serving Britannia to serving on Shan Van Vucht, which is uh, someone that he, he signed himself off a, as himself and serving Kathleen de Houlihan within the, the Irish context. And when he went to Germany in 1914, he was seeking out Irish prisoners of war. Who were these Irish prisoners of war in 1914? They were regular soldiers. They had been in the army for some time. They were part of the British Expeditionary Force, uh, which went out to confront uh, the advance of Germany through Belgium and into France. And they were regular full-time soldiers. I think it's wrong to say that they weren't interested in nationalism. I think in those days, everybody who was a Southern Catholic Irish person was interested in nationalism. It was constitutional nationalism rather than revolutionary nationalism. But they would have followed the debates in the newspapers and they probably would have known who Roger Casement was. Uh, But they were loyal to the Crown. They were British soldiers. They belonged to regiments that had histories of fighting on the British side that were as strong and as proud as those of the Scottish regiments today. And uh, they were all gathered together in the Limburg prisoner of war camp gathered together from camps all over Germany so that Casement could try to persuade them to betray their loyalty to their regiment and to the Crown and join a brigade to fight in Ireland. These were not Redmondite volunteers? No, they weren't. It was too early for Redmondite volunteers. Uh, Redmondite's uh, wooden bridge speech, I think, was uh, September, 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 September 1914. 1914. But these men had mostly been captured between... Uh, August and September uh, 1914. So they were not Redmanite men. There may have been one or two that had uh, uh, got into got into the ranks from the Redmanite men, but mostly they were regular soldiers, not 
war volunteers, not conscripts, regular soldiers. So a tough nut to crack, basically. They were hard men. They were infantry soldiers. Uh, men in barracks don't make plaster saints. That's what Kipling said. Uh, um, and they were Tommies. They were hard nosed Tommies, veteran fighters. Okay, and to what extent, Connor, was Caseman's presence in Germany, was that at his own initiative or was uh, John Devoy in New York, as was so frequently the case with Irish Republicans and the Germans? Was he behind it all? Was he the intermediary? So again, this comes to the the point that that the Roger Casement initiative to Germany is mired in plot and intrigue and espionage. And, uh, you know, if if this story wasn't so corroboratable, we would dismiss it out of hand as being so fantastical it couldn't possibly be true. Um, I do think that John Devoy certainly has has a major role to play here. We have to remember that at the outbreak of the war, Roger Casement wasn't in Ireland, he wasn't in Germany, he was in New York, he was in America trying to raise funds for guns and he was the one who had been um, central to the whole gun ring before that. So he was a, a seasoned gun runner at this point. And from Germany, Devoy obviously had very close contacts with the German embassy in, in Washington. And through that intrigue between the German embassy there and Devoy, plans were hatched to exploit England's difficulty and make it into either Ireland or Germany's opportunity or both when those two things uh, came into alignment. Tell me about his companion on the trip, a uh, trip made via Norway, the rather sinister Adler Christensen. Was he a, was he a British spy or was he just somebody on the make? Was he an opportunist? It, it depends at which point we, we take Mr. Christensen. By the time he, he got to Norway, um, his native country, he, he had travelled with Casement across the Atlantic as his, his manservant or his tra- travelling companion. And at that point, he goes to the, the British consul, uh, Finlay there. And with Finlay, he discusses what what Casement is doing and, and Finlay asks him to, well, the, the phraseology that is used to give Casement a knock on the head. So this is where assassination enters into the, the, the scheme of things. But certainly Christensen is, is subverted at some point, um, either in a long sense or by the time he gets to, to the continent and um, becomes the, the enemy within the camp of, of Casement trying to get to Berlin. OK, let's try and get some insight into the character of Roger Casement. And let's have a listen to George White, who was an apprentice law clerk to George Gavin Duffy, Roger Casement's solicitor during his trial for high treason in 1916. Here, White describes his impressions of Casement. As a person, I, I found him... A very courtly gentleman. He was kindness himself to me. Uh, He had a lovely voice, soft-spoken, inclined to be slow in his speech. But to me, it seemed that, above all, he was passionately sincere. And what he had done, he felt he had done for Ireland. I know men, I know their characters, and I don't think I've read Sir Roger's character wrongly. When I think of him as a man of sterling worth, a man who, however misguided he might be from my point of view as an Englishman, at least felt he was serving his country to the best of his ability. John, do you think George White has read Roger Caseman's character correctly? No. I think most people who met him formed that view of him. And certainly his work in, in the Congo and in Putumayo is outstanding work. It was done at the request of the British government, and it was outstanding work. But what he did in Germany, in retrospect, has to be a a catastrophic failure. Uh, It it, it shouldn't have done it. They could have organised a diplomatic recognition of Ireland in Germany. They could have organised guns from Germany. But to try and organise an Irish brigade from these hard-nosed Tommies who had been in the army for so long was, was a disaster. And a very poor judgment on behalf of Casement and the Republican movement. Tell us about the reception that he received in Limburg Prison, Connor, from the... From the Irish Brigade. Yeah. Um, I suppose it contrasts uh, starkly to the reception he had in in Berlin where he he met with some of the most high-ranking members of both the German military and also um, members of the German political elite going right up to Bettmann Hollweg, the the Chancellor, the the Angela Merkel of his day, if that isn't a strange comparison to draw. Um... At Limburg, he was received coolly. Um, He managed to convert ultimately about 50 um, men and they were actually taken out of Limburg and brought um, north towards Germany to Zosenkamp, uh, which we might talk about in a minute. But the 
the, the, the bulk of people at Limburg were not um, particularly amenable to, to Caseman's particular brand of political propaganda and invective. And while among the, the hard-nosed Tommies that, uh, that John has talked about, um, there were individuals, and we, if we think about the other 1916 leaders, two of the other executed were members of those hard-nosed Tommies. Um, James Connolly and Michael Mallon were both ex-British soldiers for pay. So there certainly were those within the ranks of the professional British army who were mm-hmm. um, subvert- subvertible or, or amenable to some form of physical force, republicanism or Irish nationalism. He was hissed and he was booed. Yes. And of the 2,500 odd men there, he got 56. Mm. I think that speaks for itself. Mm. And how did Joseph Mary Plunkett manage to wander into all of this? I mean, he did more than wander. He made very great lengths to, to get to Berlin. But what was he doing there? So I, I did I did some more reading on this recently just to, to look and to chart that extraordinary journey that Joseph Mary Plunkett takes from Ireland to Berlin um, during 1915 to link up with Roger Caseman to assist him in his task of trying to raise an Irish brigade and also, I suppose, to assist the IRB in getting a handle on what Roger Caseman was actually doing in Berlin because they weren't so sure either. Uh, John Devoy himself had, um, I suppose, begun to um, to fear that the casement mission was floundering um, quite spectacularly in, in Germany and he was quite concerned for that. But Plunkett leaves Dublin and before he leaves Dublin, he reportedly burned every photograph of himself that he could find so that the British authorities couldn't track him down. Um, and then after that point, he travels through uh, Spain, Italy and then up to Germany from the south that way, uh, travelling in the disguise of, of um, a priest at one point and various other disguises as he crosses international frontiers and borders on his way. Um, again, it's a it's a, a very daring do swashbuckling adventure that we have from Joseph Mary Plunkett travelling through these particular um, zones within wartime and under cloaks of secrecy and again with agents circulating in various parts of, of the the uh, continent in which he found himself. I think he was the man who did the organising of the brigade. By the time Plunkett arrived they'd managed to recruit seven men and they were in despair. And it was Plunkett who set about the systematic organising and the interviews of the men and managed to recruit the the next 41 or whatever it was. And what was the role of priests in the camp? Was there any significance there? The priests were very significant. There were three priests sent to the camp, two from the Vatican and one from America. The Father Crotty, who was sent from the Vatican, uh, was a Dominican priest he was actually on the staff of Newbridge College, which is a college which my children happen to go to, but, uh, 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 and I didn't know that until quite recently. But Crotty wasn't uh, what you would call a patriot. Uh, he wasn't a, a nationalist, and he did not preach nationalism to the, to, to the soldiers. He tended to their religious needs and uh, took their confessions and gave mass and so on. Nicholson, Father Nicholson, who was sent from... Uh, America by the uh, Irish Americans with the assistance of the German embassy in America. He thought the English were the devil's people and he preached on his feet and on his knees and pleaded with men to join the Irish Brigade and he actually didn't recruit any at all or hardly any at all. He was responsible for the six or seven and it was when Plunkett arrived and took over from Nicholson that it took off. And how many of the, you know, 50 odd who signed up for the Irish Brigade were complete chancers and were just basically doing it as far as you're concerned to get out of uh, Limburg and to get out of, uh, uh, you know, their prisoner of war camps? I, I, I find this difficult question to answer because you have to admire those 56 men Uh, saying to their comrades in the regiment that they had served with in the field and the regiments with all that long history, I'm leaving you, I'm going for Ireland. You have to to admire that. I mean, some of them, I have no doubt, uh, looked at the uniforms and looked at the pay and looked at the conditions and and saw it as a a soft billet uh, whilst they were uh, detained by the Germans for the duration of the war. But at the end... You know, they were Irishmen who made a choice and gave up the crown and their regiment and went. And I don't think you can dismiss it too easily. Uh, They collapsed because 
the motivation went when the rising failed. Mm. Mm. And they went, as you said, mm. Connor, to Zossen, or Half Moon Camp, which was south of, of Berlin. There was another interesting experiment uh, going on there. I don't think we have that much time to go into that. But t- tell us what happened in there and tell us about that other experiment. Well, I think this is the most important thing in terms of the, the most recent historiography on, on this. And I think we need to deprovincialize the, the Casement story and the Irish Brigade story because what was happening at the Halbmond Lager, the Half Moon Camp um, in Zossen, it's about 20 miles south of Berlin, was that the greatest project for the radicalisation of colonial troops, um, POWs who had been taken, was was underway. Um, not only was the first mosque to be created on German soil created at the camp in 1915, but also the camp was was to radicalise um, Muslim subjects, Hindu subjects, and interestingly, the Irish subjects were, were lumped in with those subjects initially, much to the Irishman's disdain, because if you think about the, the racialist attitudes that prevailed in 1915 and 1916, the men of the Irish Brigade saw themselves being classed by the German military as um, colonial troops and they said we're the first free nation of Europe we we have won our home rule and therefore we're, we're not the same as, as The Germans were actively trying to develop jihadists amongst the Muslim troops from India and from French colonial uh, Absolutely, and linking in with the Gadar movement as well, the Indian nationalist movement. So there was a much wider project to try and subvert um, Britain through its colonies and to open up new fronts in Egypt and in in, um, India as well. Very briefly, what happened to the members of the Irish Brigade? Fascinatingly, it seems that uh, obviously Casement, Monteith and Bailey go and land on Banastrand and we know what happens there and we might talk about that in, in months to come. But um, the, the Irish Brigade end up being shipped out of Zazen um, after they've been taken out of the... the um, Islamic camp, they're taken to their own camp in Zazen where they're prepared for the Irish rebellion. And after that, they simply, they don't know what to do with these people. Their leader's been taken away. They have a signed agreement that they won't take orders from German officers. They will have their own officers. So the Germans don't know what to do with them. And they send them to Danzig, modern day Gdansk, where they're actually housed on prison barges um, for the rest of the duration of the war. Some of them um, end up fraternising, getting girlfriends in uh, in Danzig and, and this kind of thing. But they undertake war work as, as ordinary prisoners. Most of them disappear into, into history. There are some who've got fantastic stories. Kyo, Sergeant Kyo, was uh, an interpreter at the 1936 Olympics. And uh, he had been in the American army, then he joined the British army, then he joined the Irish Brigade, then he joined the German army and was involved in the suppression of the workers' movement in Munich. And he actually tells a story of of firing a shot into the ceiling of a gymnasium to break up a political argument between soldiers and an agitator called Adolf Hitler. Whether you can believe that or not, I don't know. Kyo was a a, a bit of a romantic. But he had a wonderful story. He actually worked on the Pigeon House... Uh, in Dublin uh, when the Germans left at the beginning of the Second World War. I uh, feel a biography coming up. Oh, well, <laughs> no, no, no. Connor, I talk, I don't write. <laughs> Connor and uh, Connor Mulva and John McGregor, thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. We have uh, put extra information about Casement and his ill-fated crusade on our website. Join us after the break. We'll be hearing about the Battle of Franklin during the American Civil War 150 years ago today.